Hey, my name is David McCorkle, and the title of this presentation is Using Artificial Intelligence Tools for Historical Map Research. And I'm sure there's already some groans there because this is some of the biggest hype that we've seen in maybe in our lifetime. I mean, you see all this stuff about how it can help you, and it's this wonderful revolution, and it's going to change everything. And then on the flip side, we see all this evil stuff that is going to take our job, and we're all scared, and um, everything like that. And of course, the answer is somewhere in between. And my basic take on this is literally next year, I've been programming for 50 years. And starting with computers that were the size of this room that now are less powerful than what's in your pocket and your telephone. And this actually is different. You know, I've been through all the different revolutions and it's all been more evolutionary, like things got shrunk and things got faster and all this. But this, whatever they've done, is different. And I'm not going to go into the details because I don't understand it all. So I just want to talk about how we can use this or abuse this maybe. So some of the functions that this artificial intelligence is doing, um, if you type text in, so I'm talking text, you're typing it in or you're copy pasting in text, um, is answering questions, um, telling it to, uh, you know, what is kind of like what you do with Google, except it's going to give you a lot better answer. Uh, at least a lot more detailed answer, and that's why I put the caution up here, because you can't depend on it. The way it works, it got information from the Internet, it synthesizes it all together, and, excuse me, um, it's going to tell you fake stuff sometimes. A lot of times it's really good, but a lot of times it's fake, so you can't depend on it if you're going to ask it some historical question that you don't know the answer to. Um, think of it kind of like when you search in Google, you've got to go through a bunch of different hits, you know, and some are good and some are bad, and it's trying to put all that together, and sometimes the bad wins. The other thing you hear about is writing essays, articles, etc. This is the thing that uh, terrorizes uh, professors like you, where students can go in and have it write their, do their homework for it, etc., etc., and again, we're not going to really talk much about that because it doesn't apply as much to uh, historic mapping. Document analysis, this is what we're going to talk about first. Instead of having it go out in its giant knowledge base and look for information, you can feed it a specific document and say, tell me what's going on here, analyze this document, summarize this document, etc. And this has become very useful for historical analysis. Um, the other thing we deal with with history is handwriting and sometimes very bad handwriting. And there are AI tools now that can help with reading handwriting. Um, they're still not perfect, but they're getting a lot better. Another thing is analysis of images. You can give it an image, a photograph, and tell it what's going on here, break down the image, and things of that nature. We'll talk about that a little bit, how it relates to maps. And then the last one is kind of, uh, I could see it maybe eventually relating to maps, image generation. So maybe I could eventually tell it to draw a map or draw land grants or things like that. Um, but right now it's kind of just for fun. So I'm going to actually start with that just to show you the kind of things you can do is I ask it to uh, create a, uh, an image of the meeting of the Historic Mapping Congress. And this is what it came up with. So I, I think it's quite amusing. Um, a lot of old gray-haired men in formal suits and all this kind of stuff. Um, this does sound like something maybe he would be in charge of. But um, I said, no, 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 let's make this in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it kind of did interesting. You notice it's sort of got the Bank of America building there. I think that's what it's trying to show. I'm not sure why there's three images, but it's kind of like the Charlotte skyline. But then it made it very formal and very stuffy looking. So I said, well, let's make it a little more informal. And it kind of went to the opposite extreme. <laughs> I guess this could be some neighborhood in Charlotte uh, with people talking about historic maps. But one other thing I could do is I told it to create an image of Trade and Tryon in Charlotte in the year 1790, and this is what it came up with. And, um, you know, obviously, I'm sure there's lots of issues with this, um, including the, the Trade Street sign. You see it in the bottom right. I didn't think they made signs that look like that in 1790. Um, and then on the very back, I, that could be the Catawba River back there. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm going to leave this. Um, it's fun to play around with, but um, uh, you get the point of that. So the tools we're going to talk about specifically, the one you hear the most about is ChatGPT. And there are several other tools that do the same thing or similar things, and some, some are better, some not as good. We're just going to focus on ChatGPT for this discussion. 
Um, version 3.5 is the free version. You just have to create an account. You don't have to give them any money. You don't have to give them a credit card. It works on this text processing. It's not going to generate those images for you, but it can work on text. And then it's knowledge, if you will. It's basically is up to January 2022. So it's got the stuff it's gathered from the Internet, et cetera, up to January 2022. Then there's version 4. This costs you money, 20 bucks a month. And it will do the image analysis. You can feed it images and not just text. Its knowledge is a little more up-to-date, April 2023. But the other thing it can do is if it can't find an answer, it'll start, it'll start browsing the web, the current web. So that's pretty neat. And then it's got the image generation, which they call Dolly, and that's the one that will do that. Now, for the handwriting, we're not going to use Chat, B, Chat GPT. There's another tool called uh, Transcribus that will do the handwriting analysis. And it's got limits. It's free, and they'll limit you to so many documents and things like that. But, you know, when I talk about the hype and things, the, the main thing that hit me as a computer programmer is it understands what you're saying. And you say, well, yes, yeah, so do Siri and Alexa, but not like this. This thing is really understanding you. And I put it in quotes because it's all still computers in the end. You know, when I started programming computers, you had to be very precise in how you told it to do, to do something. You left out one character, one semicolon. It wouldn't work. And that's true today. You take a modern programming language. If you have the syntax wrong, it's just not going to work. It'll say, you know, can't do that. This thing, you can talk to it, not even formally, very informally, just kind of like we would talk in a conversation back and forth, and it always seems to understand it. And again, I've read some up on this. We don't know in good details, but just know that when you're talking to this, it understands you, and you can also give it more details. You can restrict it. You can say, except do this, except do that. So don't worry about telling it too much to do. Just describe what you want it to do, and then see what happens. So for the document analysis, this is the will of my uh, fifth great grandfather, John McCorkle. And you can see he's giving stuff to Susanna, furniture, cows, calves, all sorts of things. So I fed this into ChatGPT. And what I'll do is when I prompt, I'll show that in green. That tells you that's what I typed in. List what everyone received in this will in a table. Again, that's very informal. I could have said what everybody got, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I type that in, Boom, here it comes. The beneficiary, it used the word that was never appeared in the will, bequeathed items. Susanna got the furniture, money, the cows. Matthew got the plantation, and so forth and so on. Pretty darn good. And if you go through, this is actually fairly accurate. Then I just kind of got specific. List the number of acres each person got. Susanna did not get acreage. Matthew got 200 acres and 30 acres. The sons and daughters got 200, et cetera, et cetera. So I could keep asking it this question. I don't have to re-give it the context. It knows with that when I'm in this, they call them conversations, that it, it goes on the previous things I've said, so I don't have to repeat anything. I just say list number of acres, and it understands that. It understands the word acres, what I'm asking for. I said list all the enslaved people, and it came back. It says the only one mentioned was Hercules and tells this the uh, conditions then in the will, but then it... it Every now and then it decides to editorialize. It uh, mentioned that uh, bequeathing enslaved people is unethical and it's a deplorable practice, et cetera. And I'm like, I mean, we all know that, but I guess it felt compelled to let me know this for whatever reason. So um, you'll see it doing that kind of thing as you, even if, even if you didn't ask it that, it's going to tell you some things. So let's switch to um, things we're interested in with mapping. And one of them is land. One of them is deeds. And a lot of times it's important to understand who owns the land, to look for roads and things like that, or where the land or where the road is going to, etc. So I just went on the internet, went to the Chatham County NCGen website, and they got this whole list of abstracted deeds. There's like 40 or 50 of them or so. And so what I did is I copy pasted. So this is kind of what it looks like all pasted together. Um, you see, there's a lot of information in there. So the prompt I said is create a table showing the grantee, the grantor, the date, and the acres. Boom. You can see all that. In fact, let's just zoom in so you can see it better. The grantee, the grantor, the date, and the acres. Let's pull up that original. You can see that um, the first deed there, Aaron Harlan Sr. granted land to Aaron, Har Aaron Harlan Jr., it knows that the grantor, the person selling the land, was senior, and he was selling it to junior. So it understood the concept of grantee and grantor, 
and of course the date, and there's no acres mentioned in that first one, so it just left it blank. Then the second one, Reuben Petty, it sees that Gunter is buying land from Petty on this date, and that says 100 acres of land. So it was able to analyze a bunch of deeds all at once. So that's two things. You can take a big document like that will and have it pull things out of the will, or you can feed it a bunch of documents and, and summarize that bunch of documents or look for information you're looking for in those documents. Um, those of you who do surveying and mapping in places like North Carolina know about meets and bounds. That's how the land property is described. Uh, so I just took, took in this one. It was actually fictional. I use on a class I teach, but uh, you know, with all the meets and bounds and all the silly abbreviations, and I told it, show the meets and bounds in a table with each row containing direction, distance, and landmark. There you go. Simple as that. And in fact, I've been playing around with it. I can get it to put it in a format that I can then plug it into a program called Deed Mapper, and it'll actually draw the outline of the property. Now, notice I've been doing this stuff with tables. You don't have to do that. You can also just have it describe things for you. I just like tables because it really kind of emphasizes what it's doing. Now, reading the handwriting, staying on the meets and bounds, um, this is a survey from uh, that same John McCorkle, um, 200 acres of land in Mecklenburg County. And I asked Transcribus, now I'm using a different tool, Transcribus, to transcribe this. And this is what it comes up with. And it did pretty good considering, um, you know, the quality of the handwriting, which isn't that great. Um, notice right here, for example, it says the Catalbo River. But if you look up at the handwriting, that's a good interpretation of how they wrote that. Okay? So the question then is, I've got this thing, and it's, it's moving forward some spelling errors that I might not necessarily, you know, if I'm reading this manually, and I see something that says crack, C-R-E-C-K, I know they mean creek. So what I did is, here it is, the full uh, thing out of Transcribus. I went into ChatGPT and said, please correct the spelling errors. And boom. Notice at the top, Mecklen Benny County, east side of the Catawba River on the water of 12 Mile Creek, Crack, is now Mecklenburg County, east side of the Catawba River on the waters of 12 Mile Creek, which is exactly how I would have read that. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty impressed. Think about this. For it to know that Catawba was misspelled, it had to know that it was Mecklenburg County, because otherwise that could have been a legitimate name of a river. It said, aha, this survey is from Mecklenburg County. Here's a river that looks similar to that, so they must have meant Catawba River. Now, obviously, it's, it's guessing. It could have totally guessed wrong, but again, in this case, it got it pretty close. So just to summarize, there's the original. This is what Transcribus turned that into, the Catawba River, which is, you know, I could see it seeing that. But then ChatGP turned it into Catawba River. One other example from the same thing. This says, if I... I can read this and know this is talking about a white oak sampling, even though the, the A and the W kind of run together. And because of that, Transcribus interpreted that as to all het sack sapling. Now you think chat, B, chat B, GPT can fix that? And the answer is yes. It turned it into a white oak sapling. So in other words, even though the handwriting recognition has its fault, chat GPT can fix them. So let's look at image analysis. This is a picture of my aunt from um, school. I think it's back in the 30s. And I just said, how many kids are in this photo? And it said 37. <laughs> I was like, wow. I had to count, and I counted 38 people. But it ends up, this guy's not a kid. He's an adult. So it got it right. Here's another photo. This is uh, from early 1900s. It's in Monroe. It's the fire department. And the reason this is interest to me is that's my uh, great-grandfather, George Washington McCorkle. Notice, though, the fire hose is spraying in the background, and if you first look at this image, you might not notice that. So um, let's see what ChatGPT can do with that. I just said describe this photo, and notice what it said. The fire engine is equipped with a large pump actively spraying water in an arc. And, you know, you can see it kind of it identified all the buildings. It talks about the dress. It editorializes at the bottom saying the mood is serious, not necessarily somber, and so forth and so on. All right, let's get to maps. This is the, this is the Beers map of Charlotte. Um, it's supposed to be Charlotte in 1877, although the map was from the early 1900s. You can see we have this settler cemetery there, Church Street, First Presbyterian. And I said, what is this? 
in it, gave me a description of the map, talking about the, you know, schools, cemeteries, all the landmarks, mentions, etc. So I took it one step further and said, list all the people on the map. Boom, boom, boom. Wow. So it went through all that, and you see, like, for example, here's Miss Rodinger. There she is up there. But when I looked, I noticed over to the left, M.L. Beringer is not listed. And I said, oh, interesting. And I said, you did not list M.L. Beringer and a few others. And again, I don't have to give it a context. It knows we're in this conversation. And it says, oops, I'm sorry. I apologize for the oversight. Here are the additional names. Now, I can't explain to you why it didn't get them the first time around. I mean, Beringer is sideways but some of the other ones are not, so I just don't, you know. That's for a different uh, different group to discuss how it interprets images. It's all just magic to me. Now, one place where this is also used that's very useful for uh, mapping, if you're familiar with the David Rumsey map collection, is a huge collection. Um, in fact, it says 126,000 maps. A lot of them came from atlases. A lot of them are original maps. They're all scanned and digitized. And you can search for the month, like show me all the maps of North Carolina and things like that. What they have done is they've fed a subset of their maps into image analysis and pulled out all the words, kind of like what we just did on that map of Charlotte. And to do that, and this, this just came out like a couple of months ago, to do that, you see up at the top it says by text on maps. Normally you're searching by the, the metadata on the map, the people's description of the map. This says search for the text. So speaking of Catawba, let's say find all the maps that have the word Catawba, boom. It found over 700 maps with the word Catawba in it. Now, we're historic mapping, so I want to restrict that. I can go to what's called the advanced search, and I can say, no, show me all the maps between 1600 and 1800 that have the word Catawba in it. Now I get maybe it was around 30 or so maps, and you can see that it puts little push pins wherever that word appears on your thumbnail of the map. Let's go zoom in on a particular one. Um, you may recognize this, <coughs> this particular map. Um, and notice the push pins on the Catawba, uh, wherever the word Catawba is. So let's click on that. I'll get the full map. Um, excuse me. It's the Muzon map, if you're, you know, just, just to give you the answer. And you can see that all the places where the Catawba, that word appears, it shows it in blue, and I thought that was kind of funny. The one at the top, which is the Catawba River, it's curved, and the blue even follows the curves. So it's doing some pretty wild stuff here. But you can just imagine, suppose we can do this to massive amounts of maps, and you're looking for a particular road or a particular creek or something, you can say scan all these maps and look for this particular whatever you're looking for. So, I mean, this is extremely useful in analyzing these old maps. It's just, you know, we've got a long way to go, but it doesn't take much imagination to figure out how this could end up in the end with this type of uh, facility. And that's the end of the show, uh, end of the presentation. Um, I apologize for not being there to um, take any questions. Um, I may be able to stop in later today, so um, I guess if you have questions, you can either type them in the chat or maybe Hugh can write them down and um, um, I can, you know, email them to me or whatever. You have got my address uh, or, you know, again, put them in the chat and I'll see if I can answer them maybe, um, maybe around lunchtime or something like that. All right. Thanks a so bunch.